chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. Romans, chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it to our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This is part two of exercising my function in the body of Christ. The 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 14th verse, the Lord told what we call the parable of the talents. Speaking of the judgment, he says, It's like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. For you, you are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master... I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you had scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In connection with Romans 12, where 
Paul talks about the gifts that people would receive, and we don't all have the same function according to verse 4. And we see then that we have different abilities. I know some five-talent people. And usually when you see a five-talent person, they will do more than that, and they will multiply their abilities. I know some two-talent people, and they do two things very well, but sometimes they'll do more things. But then I think about being that one-talent ta person, the person who is afraid to use whatever gift that God has given them, and Jesus is very clear that if a person does not use what God has given them, the end result will be eternity apart from God where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does that not tell us that the Lord is very serious in using what he has given to us to put to work for the kingdom's sake? Pause for just a moment, if you will, about what we are. You and I are Christians. Someone was talking recently. What's one good word that describes who we are? I would say, well, Christian, one who belongs to Christ. Why do we belong to Christ? Well, because Jesus is God's son. He saw the sinful situation of man. He came here and he died for our sins, but not without teaching us how we're supposed to live as Christians. He shed his precious blood so that we might be forgiven. Not only did he do that, that we might be forgiven, he purchased the very church, his own body of people with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. Jesus was the son of God. We were lost and doomed and damned. He came here to give us hope, to give us salvation. Those who became Christians have that hope and have that salvation. And we're in that precious body that Jesus shed his blood for. Does not that just short description right there tell us how important it is for you and for me to be active members of this body that Jesus purchased with his blood? Because the church is God's people. It is the only institution on this earth that God honors above all. That makes then the church important and makes important what I do in the kingdom. I read about these talents and, and I can understand that, that even if I have one talent, one ability, Jesus says, I want you to use it. I want you to put it to work. I want to see fruit from what you're doing. In John chapter 15 and verse 8, in the context of the parable, or the discussion rather, of the vine and the branches, where Jesus would say in verse 1, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. And he goes on to talk about those who are his followers being the branches. He's talking about a fruit tree. And he says in verse 8 of John 15, And this is my father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Jesus was training these men to do his work when he went back to heaven. And Jesus was not saying that we should be satisfied with a little fruit. He says, God the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. And just thinking of that statement also, God is the one who receives the glory for what is done. Did you ever stop to think that what you're doing in the kingdom when you serve in a way that's approved by God, you're giving God glory? You're honoring his name, his holiness, you're honoring his will, and you're supporting the kingdom over which Christ is king. You're supporting the church over which Christ is head. You're an active member of a body that Jesus shed his blood for. So with those thoughts in mind, let's think about how we might use our talents. I do not believe the list that Will read to us from Romans 12 a moment ago is an exhaustive list. Those are some very central things that people can do. And maybe under those headings, there might be some subheadings of other things that people can do because there are a lot of ways, for example, to teach. There are a lot of ways, for example, to show mercy. There are many ways that God's work can be done under, subhead, under a main heading that get a lot of other things accomplished for the kingdom. But think for just a moment about your abilities. 
Don't think about your wife or your children or your grandmother or somebody else. Let's just make in your mind, or maybe if you have your bulletin, you might just make a list of things that you know that you're good at in the kingdom. And just make a list. How long a list? As long as you want to make it. Or things that you, you know that you might want to do, but you're not really as good at it as you want to be, but you could grow in that area. So I'm good at this, I'm good at this. And you know there's no boasting about this. It's something you're good at. And I'm good at this, this, and this. And these are some areas that, well, I'd like to do, and I'm not really where I want to be with those, but those are some things that I could work on and, and be better at. But when I think about this, Jesus was very serious when he talked about using what we are able to do. And Jesus said, well, the talents were given to each person according to their ability. The Lord is not asking you, or he's not asking me to do something I'm not capable of doing. He's asking me to do what I can do. So the first thing you do in contemplating this, number, point number one is contemplate. Under that, number one, look in. Look in your life. Look inside of, and put your name there and make a list of things you're good at or things you would like to improve on or things that you would like to learn to do. Timothy, we might call Timothy, sometimes we might call Timothy, timid, Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, verses 5 through 7, Paul writes to this young preacher who preaches in the city of Ephesus. And he says to him, for I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that is in you as well. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now we understand this would have been a supernatural gift for Timothy. My understanding is that it would be a gift of preaching. That was Timothy's primary job. But Paul says even though it was a supernatural gift, Timothy, you need to stir it up. The Holy Spirit didn't just force one to preach when they had that first century ability. But they had to stir it up. Is it not true that if you or I have ability, even though it may not be supernatural, we have an ability, sometimes we have to stir it up? But sometimes we're afraid. Let's be honest about it. Sometimes we are like Timothy. And Paul would tell Timothy in verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Where does the spirit of fear come from? It comes from within us. Or some outside pressure somewhere. Or just, well, just what might happen if I do this? And we get afraid and we back off. Isn't that what the... One talent man said he was afraid to use what God had given him. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, or the New American Standard Version says timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Paul is telling Timothy, you have a gift. We know according to what he said, because it was a laying on of Paul's hands, it required an apostle to lay hands on someone to receive supernatural ability in the first century. And if, and if I'm right that it was preaching, Paul says, stir it up, Timothy. Speak to people. Tell people what God says. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid, Timothy. You be a powerful young man. And I think, you know, that might be a little bit hard sometimes. But did Paul not mean what he said to Timothy? To look in. Timothy, look inside. Let me ask you, what are your fears? What holds you back from doing what you know you could do? Are you afraid of the reaction of someone? Should we not lay aside our fears and let God's word do the work or whatever we're doing? It may not be teaching. It may be something else. To do what God says because you remember we're serving under the Son of God who paid his life's blood for our sins, who put us in his church his eternal kingdom. So important then to look in. Number two, look around. What are some needs that you know of that need to be met? 
It's interesting to me how sometimes we, all of us as human beings, will say, well, somebody needs to, and you finish the statement. Somebody ought to, you finish the statement. I wish somebody would. You know how it goes. And then we get in the car and we leave and nothing happens. And I'm thinking, you know, I might be to somebody sometimes. There might be something I could do to be able to meet a need for the church. I think about some of the needs that we have. We have sick people in the congregation who need phone calls and cards and visits if they're able. Somebody says that's a preacher's job. Well, I'm looking for a scripture for that, except that as a Christian, as a preacher ought to be an example, Paul would tell Titus. We ought to be an example, but I don't think Jesus was talking to preachers in Matthew 25. He was talking to anyone who has a talent What about sending cards to some of our shut-ins who sit alone a lot? They're by themselves. And even some of our widows who can't get out and go as much as they would like to, you know people's lives do slow down. And they can use some encouragement. Phone calls. Sometimes, you know, you maybe have a 20-minute drive somewhere. Take your church directory, put it in your car, and call somebody. How are you doing today? And I call Sister Jean sometimes, and she'll just talk and talk and talk. And I know why. Because she's by herself. Oh, people love that. They really appreciate it. Share the gospel in one way or another with somebody. Get some of these DVDs back here and hand them out. Ask somebody if they would do a Bible correspondence course. And we've got the courses in the back room. But look around at some of the needs of things that could be met, even here in the church building. You might be surprised what you could find that might need some attention from time to time to help our facility. When the church began in Acts chapter 2, we know that people came from all over the world when, when the church began, and they were not, many of them, they were not going back home. And so there they were in Jerusalem without all their their goods and all their needs that they might have had at home. And we see in verse 44 of Acts 2 that all those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. I believe we could spend 30 minutes in talking about having all things in common. But we know what it means. They were together and they saw one another as a body of people who who were all together as God's people. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Focus on the last part. Regardless of what you might do to meet somebody's needs, you might sell some property like they did. You might sell some of your time, as it were, to meet somebody's need. I was listening to one of my preacher mentors recently and he was talking about how the fact that there are probably 75 percent of people in your audience that need something today and I thought if that's true maybe I need to look around and ask some questions is there something I can do for you now when we ask and you have a need don't say nothing Because sometimes that's what people will say is, well, I don't really need anything. And you know what? Even if you don't, it sure makes people feel good when you ask. It sure does. It makes people feel important. But sometimes there are needs. Say, you know, I'm glad you asked. There is something that I need. I need prayers. Or maybe somebody that, somebody like Sister Betty or somebody, there's something in my house that needs some attention. And Brother Lossie's been sick and he hadn't had time and and I, don't, I need some help. I don't know if she does or not, but she could. Sometimes we look around and we, and we ask people questions. We have a lot of single parents in this congregation now. People are struggling. There's so, single folks here, and they're struggling. And I know one thing we can do is ask them if there's anything we can do for them. Look in, look around, look up. Pray about it. In John chapter 15 again as Jesus was talking to his disciples about the work that they would do, he wanted them to take over, as it were, what he had been doing when he left. I think it's interesting. It took 12 people to do what one man did. 
He lost one of those. But you and I are the Lord's eyes. We're the Lord's ears. We're the Lord's mouth. We're the Lord's feet. But just like Jesus talked to his father about his work, we pray. Look up. Ask God to help. In John chapter 15, in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We know that 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 statement has some limitations to it, but in the area of being a part of that living, fruitful vine that Jesus says he's the true vine, being a part of that living illustration of fruit bearing, ask God to help you. I want to be better at fruit bearing. I'm just not where I want to be. I'm not, sometimes I don't even know what to do. Lord, just help me. Give me some answers here. Give me an opportunity. And I can't help but believe that when our prayers are sincere, God will open a door. Ask him for help. Is that not the context of what Jesus is stating? Because look at verse 8. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit. But before that, he said, you ask for help. God does not want us to do his work alone. As a matter of fact, he won't let us do his work alone because in verse 5, Jesus would say, apart from me, you can do nothing. Oh boy, that makes me dependent then, doesn't it? In trying to accomplish these things. Not only do I need to look in, look around, and look up, look to others. There are people who can help us. They have more experience. Sometimes... These people are living, breathing human beings that you and I can talk to. Sometimes they're in books. There are great, there's many books that have been written to help us to do God's work. But I think about Hebrews chapter 13, and we look at verse 7. And, and Paul is talking about those who, who are an example, who have set a pattern for us. How many of you know people that you have known over the years in the church, you say, boy, that was a worker right there. Or that was a wise person, man or woman. You know, those people just need, seem to, they just seem to know how to help people and you watch them. And say, well, how did they do it? How did, how did they accomplish this? And so in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, the text says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and consider the re result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. In a book that talks much about active faith in chapter 11, imitate their faith. So you look in, you look around, you look up, you look to others. Maybe you could be the one that others can imitate and if I'm not the person that others can imitate, I sure need to work on me so I can be the one that others can imitate to make sure that I'm bearing fruit for God. If God gives me five talents, he gives me two, or he gives me one. Put it to work, Jesus would tell me. And just think of the influence and the effect that it has on other people. How many of you like to work alone? Sometimes you have to. But you know, Jesus sent the 70 out to preach in pairs. And it's amazing what two people can get done compared to one person trying to work alone. As we look around at other people or look to other people, you might find somebody that can be your helper. Not always, but sometimes. And, and be able to do God's work together. But also look in again. Consider all these things. Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 7, consider what I say. Timothy, think about, think about what I'm saying. And sometimes as preachers and teachers, we need to read these outlines and think, well, Roger, what are you looking at to make your life more fruitful for God? Are you looking around for opportunities let me ask you a question. How far, really, do you think you would have to look to find an opportunity to do something for the Lord? I don't think you'd have to leave this building. You might, wouldn't even have to leave this room, would you? There are things that could be done, and 
So when we think about these gifts that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 12 and find what's, what you're good at. And don't try to be something that you're not. Because a lot of people, they, they try and say, well, I'm just not good at that. Well, and sometimes because they're not good at that, they just don't do anything. Well, that comes back to the man who's the, the one talent man. Lord, here it is. Hear what it is. You didn't do anything with it. You just, and so he gives the illustration. It's like putting money in the bank to make interest. I've seen people with one talent, and you take that person away, and you'd be surprised at how much they're missed. Just one person. And you think of, it's not a matter of five, two, and one. It's a matter of how much we do with whatever God has given us. When I think about the, I think about the commitment. So that'd be point major point number two. You dedicate. Number one, you contemplate. Number two, dedicate. What does that mean? So I'm going to do this. I'm committed. I'm going to do it, and nobody's going to stop me from doing it. I'm not going to let myself. I am convinced I'm my greatest hindrance. There's not other people. I find some way to put this off or not do it at all. When I think about 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, I want you to look at that passage with me for a moment and think about what Paul is saying at the end of that chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Powerful statement but there is a powerful context behind it. A therefore is a conclusive statement about things that have been said before. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Why did he say therefore? What's the context or the background of that statement? The resurrection of the end of time. There were people teaching the Christians in Corinth there's no such thing as resurrection. And Paul takes that chapter and makes argument after argument after argument to prove, yes, there is a resurrection, and if not, what about Jesus? Was he not resurrected? And he makes and then he talks about several things here with regard to that. But you think about how one day this body, if things go like they have been, it will die. Somebody will put it in the ground, put it in the incinerator, whatever. I'll be dead. One of these days, Jesus is coming back. And he's going to call all those who are in the graves because he was resurrected. He's going to resurrect you. He's going to resurrect me. And because, the, and, and when you come down to the end of the chapter, well, Paul, if that's so important, we ought to be working. That's exactly what he's saying. Always abounding in the work of the Lord because resurrection is coming. Judgment's coming. There are people whose souls may depend on your talent. Their destiny may depend on one or two words from you. It may depend on a friendship. But we're talking about an event here that's so... If, if you take the resurrection out of the story of Jesus, you have no story. He would still be dead. And everything he said up to there would be a lie. But he's alive. And Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren... You be steadfast, unmovable. You be faithful. You be unmovable. But it's but he, but he says unmovable. He's not saying sit in a pew. That's not what he meant, was it? No, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Somebody says, well, I don't know if it'll do any good. Paul took care of that. He says, look, your labor in the Lord's not in vain. It's going to produce something good for God. And when I come back to... To the, to the original idea of all these gifts. I think, Lord, just use me. 
Use me. Help me. Help me. Help me serve you. How many of the apostles would have been excused should one or more of them said, well, I just refuse to bear fruit. Do you think the Lord said, that's okay. I don't think he's going to say that. How many of us have gone over Paul's list in Romans 12 with just a mere glance, and I'll be glad when that preacher gets through so I can go eat my lunch. These words are given to us to meditate on, and Sometimes, though, when I look at these things, I have to get out of my comfort zone. Timothy, don't be timid. Don't be afraid. Reach out. Say something you've been wanting to say, but you didn't have the courage to do it. Say it anyway. You might be surprised how easy it would be to say it the second time. I've known some timid people who just wouldn't talk to much of anybody. But they began to speak to people and talk to people and develop relationships, and it came slowly. And now they're the ones visiting or greeting the visitors when they come through the door. Well, they grew out of that somehow. They moved past that fear, that timidity, that fear to reach out and do something a little bit more. Then I think about how that... God has committed a trust to us. Because, brethren, I know for a fact Jesus in that parable was not really talking about money necessarily. He could be, but that really wasn't his main point. It's just whatever God is giving to you. In writing his second letter, in the English Standard Version of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says something here, and the ESV is a little different than other translations. He says, which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Why do I believe the ESV has that right? Listen as he keeps on going. In verse 13, Timothy Follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. What are you saying, Paul? God gave me an ability. God gave me an opportunity. He gave me a charge. And it's been entrusted to me. And I'm going to guard that until I die. Matter of fact, he says that I'm going to guard it. I'm going to guard it until the judgment day. In other words, I am going to keep on doing what God has put in my hands. And Timothy, you must do the same thing. And Timothy, obviously, again, was a timid young man, was afraid. But Paul charged him. And I figure Paul... There were times he was afraid. How many times did those Jewish people try to kill that man for what he did? But he didn't let it stop him. Did Paul understand Luke 9, 23 through 26? Somebody says, now, Roger, you read Luke 9, 23 an awful lot. Oh, yes, I do. You know why I read Luke 9, 23 a lot? Because I need it. I need this for me. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And he would say in verse 24, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and he himself is he loses or forfeits himself. <clears throat> what about our pursuits versus the cross? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. That scares me to death. To think that I might not be denying myself to do what God wants me to do. Is this statement really true? 
Jesus, did you really mean what you said here? And if we believe it's true, do we live like we believe that it's true? Because the lesson is all about giving myself away. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an anti-Nazi who died in April of 1945 in a German concentration camp. He wrote a book entitled The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book he wrote, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I don't know if he read Luke 9, 23 and following when he wrote that or not. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And I thought, well, I can't argue with that. We sang a song just a few moments ago, and it's a pretty song. The harmony is great, but the words say, Where he leads me, I will follow. He talks about all the ways that we'll follow him. And one of the statements in the song says, All the way. Maybe we sing those songs and they don't sink deeply into our hearts. But we should sing with sincerity and mean what we say. I think about our abilities. And brethren, don't be afraid to do what God has given you the ability to do. Just, just use what God has given you. And when you do that, there's nothing to be afraid of. It might be scary at first. You might mess up. You think... You might just mess up. You might embarrass yourself, but you get better. I think about the first sermon I preached. I think about some of the first prayers I prayed publicly. I think about some of the first times I led singing, and I thought, I'm not that same guy. That's been a long time ago. I think about talking to people about certain things that when I was younger, I wouldn't do it. But I decided one day the Lord wants me to. I'm going to do the best I can. If you're here this morning and you don't feel like you're the servant of God that you ought to be, commit yourself to be better. Dedicate yourself to be a servant. Give yourself to the Lord. There's nobody better. You're in the kingdom. You're in the church that he bought with his blood. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never confessed the sweet name of Jesus. You've never repented of your sins. And... You've never decided that he's going to be your Lord and you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins. You can do that. You start out as a babe in Christ and you'll grow and mature. And the Lord bids you to come if there's any way he can serve you as we stand and sing.